Hello, Lucy Pringle. Hello, Lilu. How nice to hear you again. Yes, it's nice to, to hear you again, too. Uh, you're, you're a photographer and you've been researching around crop fields for many, many years. And you yes. recently uh, wrote an article called High and Lows. That's can you, right. Can you tell us about this article? Well, it's really based on uh, what was happening in the fields uh, last year in the crop circle world and reports that uh, many kind people have sent me in about what happened to them and also about my research and my research is based on the um, effects of electromagnetic fields on living systems which really is to say what happens to us uh, what happens to animals when they go into crop circles and also what happens to uh, mechanical instruments or electrical instruments uh, such as camcorders, cameras, uh, mobile telephones, etc. And this research has been going on for many, many years. And each year we reassess our results and then we try to make improvements and we think about uh, how we can uh, improve our methodology for the following year. I think science is all about that. You, you never come to an easy answer right away. And in fact, it's only, it's only by building up data over the years um, and, and, and having a sort of a database that one can um, improve and, and come to more sort of uh, reliable um, and um, mainstream scientific results. Mm -hmm. So what did you find? What, what, what new, or is there new conclusions that you're drawing? Uh, no, there are no new conclusions. Um, we are continuing with the uh, water that I bury. I bury little um, 100 ml bottles of water. Uh, they're volvic water because that's the most constant. It doesn't go above 4 hertz. And then these are buried and in different locations. First of all, the control samples are buried first outside the crop circle so that they never, never go into the circle. Uh, then um, more bottles are buried at various parts in uh, of the of the formation they're left there for a certain amount of time and then they're collected and the ones inside are collected first and the control samples are collected last in that way as i was saying the control sam samples never never go into the um uh the formation and of course it's quite difficult to find the bottles once they're buried uh, especially when people go in and they sit on the centers and the whole uh, physiology or physiognomy of the of the of the uh, circle the formation has changed so we use dowsing techniques and so this brings in also another element of, uh, of dowsing and, and a friend of mine is looking into the dowsing aspect and finds that dowsing in fact is linked to physics and he's going to be writing a book on this so it's all quite exciting but um, in order to, um, we're, going to we're going to do a, an additional test this year. We're going to attach little capacitors <coughs> to the bottles of water. And in that way, we'll be able to do an additional test, which will measure the, the, well, the capacitors, will measure, the, will measure the in joules, which is a scientific uh, measurement. Um, so... This is um, uh, an, an additional um, area of research that we're, we're going to be doing. Mm. Is there, is there, is, is there yeah. something in particular that you want to show or prove scientifically? Or are you just uh, allowing the science to reveal some new elements? Well, what we, what we do each time is to really illustrate that in the genuine formations, there is a difference between what we're finding inside the formation and what we're finding outside the formation, i.e. in the control samples. And in that way, it is telling us that something is happening inside the genuine crop circles that is not happening outside. And if we can put that into scientific measurements, uh, then we're going a long way to illustrating um, possibly how the, the force actually hits the ground, etc. 
Mm. Is, is that force the same than the intelligence that you refer to in your article? The intelligence, well, that is possibly a, a consciousness. That, I think, is possibly the driving force behind the force, if you like. Um, the intelligence behind the force, but the, the, the force itself, I'm quite convinced, is just a combination of a whole lot of natural forces. But there has to be, as I've, I'm absolutely certain, there's a driving, a driving element behind all this. And mm -hmm. that is the intent, as, as I see it. And is part of your research to try to understand uh, those crop circles and their meanings? Because last time you, you were saying uh, that each of us have a different feeling and each of us have something different to discover from it and, and, and just look at them like mandalas. But is there, is there some particular messages that could, be, uh, that could be attached to them? Or is your research helping to, to really describe something more global? No, I don't think so. I mean, many people believe that, that the crop circles are telling us how we are damaging the planet. Uh, but these are individual interpretations. This has nothing to do with the scientific aspect of it. But I feel that the scientific aspect isn't the only aspect. And that many people have these wonderful experiences, just like this man, Steve Meredith, who'd had an accident when he was young, a skiing accident. Uh, it hadn't, he hadn't broken any bones, but he had um, damaged the muscles in his, in his neck. And um, over the years, um, the, the pain got uh, worse and worse and worse, increasingly bad, um, until he got to the stage where uh, he could only sleep on, on one side of his head and he had to have special pillows, etc. And he and his wife went down to the Marlborough area this summer. And they went into, oh, I think they said 12 or 13 different crop circles. And he went into one which we call the hummingbird. And he said he was just sitting there and he simply couldn't believe it. One moment he was in a tremendous amount of pain. And the next moment he said, uh, where's the pain gone? It had gone. And the hummingbird, of course, is had lovely sort of mythological legends attached to it. In the Andes, they think that the hummingbird uh, dies during the night and, and, and that it comes to, to life during the, the morning and therefore it represents and is a symbol of, of uh, resurrection and, and, and eternity. And the Aztecs believe that the hummingbird um, was brought back, it appeared in, in, in the shape of the souls of their dead warriors, and they were known as the butterflies of the, of the Andes. They appeared either, either as um, hummingbirds or, or um, butterflies, and they were known as the butterflies of the Andes. So there are many, many, many lovely aspects to uh, this phenomenon uh, from many different angles. How, how can we measure the uh, psychological uh, p part of it? Meaning that when people go in the crop circle, they already know that they're going on it. So how do you dissociate that, 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 you know, that psychological effect? Well, many people, when they go in, they expect to, they don't know what's going to happen to them, but many of them have read my, my articles, which I write up each year. And the one you're talking about is the one that I wrote up relating to last year's events. And they expect to, they don't know what is going to happen, but it's a lovely day out and they just expect to have a really good time. But that doesn't always happen. And this is what takes them by surprise when suddenly they feel dreadfully sick. Or there was, there was one woman uh, two years ago who... Um, she was in a crop circle with me, and I, I was with a group of other people, so I never saw this happening, and I felt rather bad about it afterwards, that she, she'd been sitting meditating, and she, she went to stand up. She was with her husband, and she fell right back, and she, she tried to get up again, and again she went right backwards, and she wrote to me, and she said it was, it was just as though somebody flung her back, and I said, well, 
you know, maybe I looked into this from a medical point of view. I said possibly this was known as a drop syndrome, where you just suddenly drop. And um, she said, she said, I don't care whether there was a drop syndrome or not. She said it felt like being picked up by a wrestler and thrown to the ground. Well, certainly she didn't expect that. And many, many other things. I mean, I've got a database now of over 700 reports that these wonderful people have sent me in. And it's due to these reports, and I'm eternally grateful to them, that help me in my research as to what is going on. Because from the psychological point of view, uh, there are all sorts of, there are different le levels of consciousness. We have the beta, alpha, theta, and delta, which are all judged on different altitudes and frequencies. And you and I are now in the beta, because we're thinking we're in our logical state of mind, and that, I think, goes from uh, 15 to 30 hertz, etc. Then there's the alpha, and the alpha is an interesting one, because it's the bridge between the conscious and the self-conscious. Mm -hmm. And subconscious rather and then we have the theta and that is a lower down and then eventually we have the delta and strange things happen in in all of them you can get spikes between 18 and 18.5 hertz which indicates a, an extraordinary sense of oneness when people go in they quite often find that they're talking to people, and it's as though they've known these people all their lives, and it's and they feel at one, not only with the universe, but with everybody else in the in the crop circle, and that also is uh, relating to the high chakra. So there's an awful lot involved, Lily, which you know we're just investigating on so many different levels. So would you say it's bringing a new energy on the planet? Like just the fact that those crop circles are more and more uh, seen and more and more present, it's contributing to, 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 to a shift or bringing additional energy that is needed right now? I think it's helping in the increased um, awareness on the planet. But at the same time, just as you get light reflecting dark and dark reflecting light, in fact, uh, you wouldn't observe light unless you had darkness. Um, you're getting this element that is trying to ridicule the crop circles. And this is what happens in, in the press. I think last time we spoke about the National Geographic. Did we not speak about that? No, Where, no, go ahead, please. Well, that was a very interesting thing because uh, two years ago, uh, they asked me to do a program really relating to my 20 years research. And uh, I said, who else was going to be involved? And they said, oh, oh nobody else, nobody else but, but you. So anyhow, we met in a, um, a crop circle down in uh, Yatesbury. And I was rather surprised at the superficial level of their questioning. And anyhow, we completed the, the interview. And then several days later, another uh, circle appeared, and I, I didn't like the look of it terribly, so I got onto the uh, pr uh, producers for the National Geographic, and I said, has that circle by any chance got anything to do with you? No. Oh, yes, they said. We paid the farmer, uh, and certain people made it. The hoaxers made it. I said, but this is, this is not what we agreed. We agreed I was going to be the only person on this program. Oh, don't worry, Lucy, don't worry. When you see the program, you'll be quite happy. Well, when I saw the program, I had half a minute coverage, and the hoaxes were given two and a half minutes. So I wrote up in on my um, website in the news bit about, about this. Well, last year, I was also invited again by um, the National Geographic to do a program. And I said, just go to my website and read the article I wrote about you last time. And I don't think you will want me on your program. <laughs> so I then wrote to several other researchers all over the world. And I warned them. I said, if you're invited by the National Geographic, watch out. Well, I had uh, an email from a Dutch researcher, Paul Bert Janssen. Now, he, many, many people stay up all night hoping to see one of these, um, these uh, circles appear. Mm -hmm. 
and they put themselves at vantage points like the Wands Dyke, etc. And uh, this researcher was walking past Silby Hill one night and he saw lights towards the West Kennet Long Barrow, which is very close to Silby Hill. So he walked towards these lights mm -hmm. and he saw a film crew and he went up to the producer and, and she said, oh, we're doing this for the National Geographic. Oh, he said, well, what are you doing? Well, he, she said, these men are creating a circle by moonlight. Well, if you saw those two great floodlights, you could realize the moon had absolutely nothing to do with them uh, making the circle. Um, and so he went over to see what they were doing. And there they were with their boards and they were walking round a circle. But that circle had appeared three weeks before. Mm. Now, the way the National Geographic shot that program, <coughs> Mrs. Joe Public and Mr. Joe Public would have had no idea that those men weren't actually creating the circle themselves. Mm -hmm. Now that to me is dishonesty, deception, almost fraudulent. And why is, I was talking to many people and I said, what do you think about the National Geographic? Oh, it's a, we admire it so much. It's a, it's a mm -hmm. magazine of authority, respectability. We know that what we read there has been well researched. It's scientifically accurate. And I said to myself, well, what pressure has been put on the National Geographic? Such a powerful um, magazine journal to go to such lengths and stoop to such lengths of dishonesty. So how did what that leave happened? you? How did that leave you? Well, I disillusioned, very disillusioned. And this is what you're saying. Well, does it affect the planet? Do these crop circles have a... Um, an effect on what <coughs> is happening in the world today and the planet. And I would say yes, up to a point, but we are struggling against the uh, misconceptions and the dishonesty of the media. First, first I want to you know, thank you for, 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 for speaking in my QR with us through the internet, which is definitely one of the medium where people can speak probably a little bit more freely and openly. Um, I think it's a very different type of media and we've seen it recently with some events where information, all kind of information is circling on the internet but at least uh, uh, you could have your voice and, and, and voice out you, you know, what your experience of this. So thank you for, for, for speaking what's so for you. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I know that you won't edit this and this is, this is I, will, I won't do any programs now. I turned down four programs last year because uh, I knew they were going to be edited and that anything that I said that might relate to any sensible science or any credibility I might give the subject would probably be edited out. So I, I appear on very, very few uh, television programs or, or documentaries now. And you were asking, well, how do we, how do we deal with this? Um, I yeah. think, again, we have to be very careful uh, in what programs we, we appear and just to keep our head down and continue with our research and then write it up and give lectures and talks all over the world so that people can actually hear and know what is going on. But you have to have had over the years, you've had to have built up a, um, a reputation, a reputation of honesty and integrity and just giving out the facts uh, rather than um, <laughs> rather than just giving out sensationalistic uh, events and I think a lot of people do tend to sensationalize things just to catch the the news mm -hmm. and, and and that doesn't work in the long run you're you're not taken seriously if you do that mm -hmm. No, no, I, I, I hear, and that's how I felt through our, our first interview that that you wanted to put it, uh, it on a scientific level as much as possible. But from interviewing other people, for example, yesterday, my case on the on the DNA and on pi and on sacred geometry, you know, we know that yes. that that the intuition uh, you must have intuitions about all this, and this is for us very important to hear what are your intuitions too. 
and, and it's and it's beyond the, the scientific but this is very interesting to us for people or some people I'm sure following you to, to hear that oh it is it's very important because the intuition I always feel that all scientific discoveries are actually based originally on the intuition of that individual and his ideas and where do those ideas come they say well there aren't any ever any new ideas but uh, it's how you treat those ideas and what you you do with them. And uh, yes, I, I quite be, I I absolutely believe that all science is based on intuition. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to get your own intuition, but I guess my own I intuition. Think... What about the circles? Yeah, about the circles. Well, I think they are. They are manifestations of beauty and um, I think that if anybody has got an inquiring mind crop circles is is the subject you need to become involved in because there's music there's math there's uh, wonderful again intuition there's spirituality there's healing there's not necessarily in every case, this I must stra stress, but a uh, wonderful feeling of wellness, if you like. Many people go into them and they feel so wonderfully well. And, and there was this wonderful, lovely woman who came with me on one of my tours this, this last summer. And she was, I think she was almost 80. And it was a 14-hour day and she wasn't certain if she was going to make it. And one of the circles we, we were walking towards, uh, it was a lovely uh, farming couple who'd opened their field and I think we paid a pound to go in and all the money went to cystic fibrosis. And this happens, everybody's happy to contribute when the farmers put out their honesty boxes. But it was a long, long hike. We walked along the bottom of the field and then there was a long climb up all and sort of going around in a curve. It must have been almost a mile to get to the formation and she was tired when she got there and she sat down and she said she said she just felt rejuvenated and then we went off to Stonehenge and she leant against one of the stones because I get this private entry permission to go in and it's very difficult to, to get private entry permission I have to book up over a year ahead and because it's so much in demand and people lean up to get the private entry one, they can lean up against the stones and they can feel the energy. And and this is the wonderful part of this, that you are feeling the energy of the crop circles, you're feeling the energy of the Stonehenge stones, and there is energy in the landscape. And again, I think this takes us on to the uh, intuitional side where maybe some people feel the energy more than others. But anyhow, this woman, she went home, she felt absolutely brilliant, she slept, she said she'd never slept so well for years and years and years, and she said she woke up as bright as could be the next morning, not tired in the very least. So there are wonderful, wonderful stories and wonderful things that happen to people uh, due to the crop circles. And you didn't make a book of that. You have a book, I know, of all the pictures, because you took a lot of pictures of crop circles. So you, so you recommend that we just look at those crop circles and that we feel You're its vibration, but you, you don't have a book of all the stories, have you? Not. No, no, I've got my first book. My first book, which is now out of print, but I do have one or two hard copies left, was Crop Circles, The Greatest Mystery of Modern Times. And that was... Um, that was brought out by Thorson's Harper Collins. And then there's another little book which was brought out by the Pitkin Press, which again gives more stories and, and more events. But I have so many stories, Lilu. I have I have a um, sort of encyclopedia of stories. Mm -hmm. And I think what I'm going to be doing, I'm going to be writing up well a, a great friend of mine who is a scientist, he's going to be He's going to bring out a book on mainstream science first and then he and I are going to write a book about the crop circles and I'm going to be talking about what happens to people and he's going to relate what happens what my my uh, reports he's going to link that to mainstream science 
uh, which is going to be a really, really important book, and that is going to catch some worldwide interest. But I, what I would recommend that people do is maybe go onto my website and read my articles, which I, I bring out every year. And it, they're just filled with, with wonderful stories. I, I feel so humble sometimes when I listen to what people tell me. The, the quite miraculous things that, that seem to have happened to them and how going into crop circles have affected their lives and they don't care whether there's any science linked to it or not and, and quite rightly so because you know it's, it's unimportant to them it's just changed their, their perception of life and perception of how they deal with other people how they deal with problems um, etc so I think they have a wonderfully overall beneficial they're a wonderfully beneficial gift to us um, yeah well thank you Lucy thank you for taking the time to to do this interview with us not not at all I think it was Sherlock Holmes who said um, something like when you have eliminated the impossible whatever remains um, no matter how improbable um, must be the truth. Okay, so we'll leave it at that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lucy.